welcome to Brookdale's Visiting Writers Series. My name is Dr. Michael Brook. I'm a professor in the English department, and I'm very excited to be here today with poet Kathleen Graber. Hello. Uh, Kathleen Graber is the author of Correspondence, uh, the winner of the 2005 Saturnalia Book Prize, and also of The Eternal City, uh, which has been a finalist for both the National Book Award and the National Book Critics Circle Award. Um, she's also held a, a Hodder Fellowship at Princeton University and been the Amy Lowell Traveling Scholar uh, as well. She's taught at NYU and is now teaching creative writing at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, and it's, I'm thrilled that you can be here today. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Wonderful. And I, I've been reading Eternal City um, and just been mesmerized about it and found it graceful and very different from a lot of the books that I've been reading lately. Um, you were traveling a lot when you were writing sure. these pieces. For some of it, yes. Okay. It, took, it, it takes a long time to write a book of poems. So some of them I wrote when I was living here in New Jersey. Some of them I wrote when I was on the Hodder Fellowship at Princeton. And then the last section I wrote when I was the Amy Lowell Traveling Scholar in some strange parts of Europe. <laughs> okay, right, because you traveled all over Europe during mm -hmm. that time for a year? For a year, correct? right, that's the, I mean, sometimes it's, uh, I've heard it referred to as the banishment prize. Uh, you have, you get a certain amount of money and then the only obligation is that you leave the continent of North America for a year. It sounds like a wonderful banishment, <laughs> actually. Uh, yeah, it's, it's um, I think it was terrific when the dollar was doing a lot better against <laughs> right. the euro and the pound, and it's, it's a lot less terrific now that the dollar is not as strong. True. Well, well the title, The Eternal City, Rome, made me imagine that uh, most of the poems were somehow going to be connected with Europe. And in fact, it seems many of the poems have touchstones that are, whether it's, it's, they are epigraphs or paintings, um, but, but why the Eternal City? Why that title? Why the emphasis on, on Rome? Or was that not in your thinking at all? No, no. The first book, the first poem I wrote for the book was the poem that's called The Eternal City. And so it was, I happened to be reading an essay by Joseph Brodsky about Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I wanted to sort of talk back a little bit to Brodsky and to Aurelius. And so I sat down and, and wrote a little response to them. Uh, and I think in the essay, it's called um, Homage to Marcus Aurelius, but I think he may refer to Rome as the eternal city uh -huh. in the essay. So early on, the idea that Rome was the eternal city uh, was in my head. But then my, in my responding back to them, I sort of proposed, no, no, the eternal city is really the mind. It's not really a uh -huh. specific geographic landscape, but it's an internal landscape. Uh -huh. And then um, I fortuitously came across a quote from Freud in which he, his favorite city was Rome. He, was, he had a large collection of antique artifacts, in fact. Um, and he was, in talking about Rome, sort of said that Rome is really um, a metaphor for the psyche and that uh -huh. the psyche is a place where on any given lot, anything that has ever existed there simultaneously exists. Um, so the past, the present, and in some ways the future mm -hmm. are all there together simultaneously. And so I liked that idea, and that's the epigraph for the book. And that holds for Rome itself, which is built upon ruins, built upon ruins, but you're also saying, I think, that it holds for the mind as well. Right, that you don't ever... I mean, and in some ways, so many people that I knew, my parents, for example, all of the aunts and uncles, largely from my childhood, are deceased now. Uh -huh. But they certainly don't feel very far gone to me. They're really uh -huh. still, I hear them in my head. I know what, in a certain situation, what my father would say. You know, uh -huh. I, I, and I sometimes will you know, correct him <laughs> mentally. I'm like, Dad, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's, just, that's not generous. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, so the and past just, is very present. The past is very present for me. Uh -huh. um, they were larger than life characters, and so they live there. They live inside of me still. And, and then I also feel like I have quite an intimate relationship with authors who are deceased. I've never, they've been dead as long as I've been reading them, mm -hmm. you know, probably for a millennia before that. Um, and so 
they, those, they feel um, present to me. They feel alive and real, at least as important to me as the people that I stand behind in line at the post office or something. Mm -hmm. Well, then, can I ask you to read a poem, then, that I think... Um, Will will display the sensibility, the synthetic a priori. Poem. Okay. Could you read that to us? Sure. Okay. Um, so, do you, I should probably say maybe some things. Should I say something about this poem, uh, um, or just go for it? Go for it, and then I'll ask you about what. Okay. What uh, is going on so here? So it has perhaps. an um, epigraph from Immanuel Kant, the critique of pure reason, and uh, it's and he says. What objects may be in themselves and apart from all this receptivity of our sensibility remains completely unknown to us. We know nothing but our mode of perceiving them. With this alone have we any concern. At a church rummage sale, I studied the perfection of shadows in a painting by Caravaggio. Although what I hold is only a small print of Christ, its frame broken, dining at Eumaeus, with three of the apostles. And because the table is dramatically, if not unbelievably lit, the bowls and pitchers and loaves send their dark crescents onto the immaculate white cloth. When the Savior raises his hand to offer a blessing, its shade deepens further his crimson smock. Tenebrosus, that rich convincing darkness, as though the master understood that the obscured world only seems to us somehow even more familiar. As though our own sense of our unknowing had at last been made visible. Even if what we do not know cannot itself be seen. The futures drape the carnival fortune tellers of my childhood might have called it, but also the nows displayed as it is, so many unmatched cups and saucers old coats and wicker baskets all around us. At a party last week, someone said verisimilitude. We were huddled on a tiny porch. It was the first cool night and the wine had no conclusion. The talk turned quickly to shepherds and the pastoral and then to opera before someone recalled a horror film he'd watched late one night with his brother. Bl in black and white vignettes, an evil tree stump, possessed by the spirit of an executed prince, hunts the scheming tribal elders who have destroyed him. A former pro wrestler in a costume of wire and rubber bark and wearing a permanent scowl lumbers after vengeance in the confusion and fear of 1957. On a half dozen root legs, driving his victims into quicksand or toppling himself over upon them. Though here the point is the teller's small brother and the, boy, boy, I'm sorry, and the boy's allegiance, even in a state of suspended disbelief, to what we call sense. How, he wanted to know, suddenly, unusually earnest, did the tree manage to get itself up again? Yesterday, I spoke to a friend who was despairing. Back home, waiting tables, he's dating a woman whose marriage has only just come to an end. When he wakes, he discovers he does not recognize himself. One afternoon, walking home from school, I hit my best friend in the face with a book. It may be she hit me. Thin pages flew out into the street. More punches were thrown, and I came away bruised. In that book, a novel by Emily Bronte, the land is violent and unjust, and we are violent and unjust upon it. Even worse, our greatest passions change nothing at all. Before one of us hit the other, there must have been a cause, but I can't recall it, which makes it seem nonlinear now, and thus apocryphal, both impossible and impossibly real. I failed, though I tried, to offer comfort. It's not that our lives don't resemble our lives. I've been alone so often lately, I sometimes catch myself watching myself, breathing in the fresh spears of rosemary or admiring the shallots, peeling their translucent wrappers away, centering one on the board, making the first careful cut, 
lifting the purple halves. Before stories, we were too busy for stories, too busy hunting and suffering to invent the tales of our own resurrections. Caught out in the kitchen's brightness last night, the handle of the skillet cast its simple, perfected form across the stove, pierced like the eye of the needle, so that it can be hung from a hook, as pans presumably have always been. Outside, the wind picked up, thunder, the dog trotted off, hit her head beneath the chair. But today, a charity sale at Trinity Chapel and sun on the tar of the buckled walks. In the cracks, beads of water spin into light. Tell yourself it's simple. This is where it's been heading all along. Tell yourself something you have no faith in has already begun to occur. Thank you very much. There's so much to talk about here. <laughs> it's a long poem. <laughs> it, it, it is a long poem, but you know, often we don't have the patience, I feel like these days, to, to be able to dwell in that narrative, lyric, sonic space. And I, I appreciate being asked to do that. I think these poems ask a lot of the readers, but I think they also seem to give a lot. Thank you. As well. So um, when we come back in just a minute, uh, we're going to speak more with Kathleen Graber about her work. And I especially want to know more about uh, what your impulses were as you were first beginning to fashion this poem. Oh, OK. <laughs> I'll think about that. <laughs> think about that. As soon as we come back, this is Brookdale's Visiting Writers Series. I'm Dr. Michael Brook. We'll be back in just a minute. This is Brookdale Community College. You are watching Brookdale Television. Turn it down. Lowering your thermostat just one degree can cool your heating cost by 3%. Answer the call. This could be good. Hey, you. We'll get you moving. Because when you get moving an hour a day, you'll have more energy to do the things you like to do. So be a player. Get up, play, and move it your way. Check out how to be a player at letsmove.gov. That's www.letsmove.gov. Welcome back to visiting writer, Brookdale's Visiting Writers Series. Um, I'm very pleased today to be speaking with uh, poet Kathleen Graber. Kathleen, you just read um, a, a wonderful piece that is working on so many levels. It goes so many different places. And I'd like to talk about some of those places <laughs> okay. that, that it goes. Maybe starting with, with the title itself, The Synthetic A Priori, which everyone in the audience uh, watching may not know about. So can you speak a little bit? It's about sure. judgment, isn't it? Right. Well, it's actually, um, <laughs> there's, there was a division between, uh, in constructing how, how we perceived experience. And so there was the idea that there was either um, things which were obviously given, or there was experience which came in sort of through the, through the senses mm -hmm. and it made an impression upon us. And Kant came up with the idea that there was sort of a hybrid. There were a couple of things that were hybrid. They weren't exactly outside of us, but they weren't fully inside of us. They were sort of the membrane through which experience passed. Mm -hmm. And that's the synthetic a priori. It's the constructed given or the made given, and those are space, time, and uh, causality, and mm -hmm. the idea that one thing causes another. So how does that title, <laughs> <laughs> you knew this was oh, coming. Now you're gonna have the, now the, now the, here's the, what's that got to do with the poem? 
Um, well, it certainly moves around in space and time and, and causality a great deal. We have, you know, being in front of the kitchen sink as well as being at the rummage sale and then Caravaggio, which, you know, suggests the Eternal City, which suggests Rome. So it, it compiles to a great deal. Um, Right. It started out really, I think, um, about thinking about this friend who literally had phone, phone, phoned me and sort of was really um, despairing and sad and, and mm -hmm. was in a relationship that he didn't necessarily have any confidence in the future of the relationship, but he also just didn't have any confidence in the future of his own future uh -huh. and, um, and sort of... Uh, not me not knowing what to say, but I arrived in the process of writing the poem at this sort of um, adage, which is just tell yourself that this is where it's been heading all along, that there's some kind of sense of fate or things are unfolding, causes are working themselves into effects, even mm -hmm. as you go through your days and you can't see it happening. Mm -hmm. And so that seemed to me like the synthetic a priori at work, this sense of causality and that there are the thing, there's a history unfolding in your life, even though you can't perceive it, and it's entirely possible that that history is, that sense of history is manufactured, and, that, and really our lives don't have um, a trajectory to them, but we certainly experience them as though they do. We experience in them, and then how do we come to knowledge? Do, do we come to knowledge and understanding through these experiences? Well, we have to, they have to pass through the membrane. And so the <laughs> membrane makes sense of the experiences. Mm -hmm. It's not, um, he was actually sort of offering um, a response to the idea that we're a slate mm -hmm. of, you know, blank slate and things get kind of inscribed on us. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, well, maybe we actually have a little more of an active role to play in that process. Is writing a poem for you as a poet a way of coming to knowledge or understanding yourself? Yeah, I think that's exactly. My undergraduate degree, um, and I don't propose that this was makes me a great philosopher, um, was in philosophy. So I have okay. the most rudimentary ex understanding of philosophy that is possible for <laughs> someone to have. Um, but, I, but I milk it for all it's worth, <laughs> that little bit of knowledge. Um, but I, I remember um, feeling sometimes dissatisfied with uh, philosophy sort of coming to the end of what it could arrive at logically. You know, there are just some things that philosophy can't seem to make any sense out of. Mm -hmm. they, we just have to sort of agree not to know that that's something that can't be known. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the other hand, I, I would, you know, I myself haven't been able, to, like, you know, Faithful people would say that's where you take the leap of faith. Mm -hmm. And so I, I can't seem to leap myself, though mm -hmm. I admire greatly those who do. Um, and so I thought, well, poetry sort of fills the gap. It's sort of, it's a kind of leap of faith right. that we can make sense out of things in a way that's not wholly logical. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that's what poetry does for me. There are many of these poems that do draw on, I believe, your experience um, in s growing up and, and living in, in South Jersey, in Wildwood mm -hmm. in particular. And it, it's fascinating to me because that experience of being on the boardwalk in Wildwood, I, I think of, you know, it's what you do during the summer. It's so much fun. It's frivolous in a sense, in a, in a positive way, but also perhaps in a dark way. But then these poems are so um, uh, full of uh, allusions and ideas that they seem divorced in a sense from that frivolity, but it, but it, but it comes in, it creeps in. To yeah, the it does, I mean, I think a little bit it does. Uh, it's very different to be the person on the other side of the counter or the person who's selling you the ticket to the ride mm -hmm. as opposed to being the person going on the ride. Mm -hmm. And so I think that my um, sense of the amusement park or the arcade uh, is much more uh, of the the sort of view of it that the person has who just sees frivolity as an outsider looking in. Like, I'm not the one having fun. I'm the one sort of facilitating everybody else's good time. Uh -huh. And you have a lot, it, it lends to a sort of um, a certain degree of philosophizing about the nature of good times. <laughs> uh -huh. Um, these poems seem very narrative in their philosophizing. Mm -hmm. um, 
And yet it's a narrative unlike most of, of the narrative poems I read today because they also make all kinds of connections that aren't in, in a strict sense, you know, f they don't go with the story necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe Correspondence, the title of your first book, suggests that mode of, of writing a poem for you has been may maybe yeah, where you always seems, were. Is this, this seems like this. This, se okay. this seems really, yeah, that's, I mean, the process is sort of, oh, I just sort of start, writing about something and then something else pops into my head mm -hmm. and I say oh these two things are not dissimilar from each other in some way and and then I and then I just trust myself that I right. will figure out why they feel like they're connected to me so why mm -hmm. does you know it's sort of like my friend having this very bad day and then there being a big thunderstorm that night and me waking up the next day and it being a kind of perfect day obviously mm -hmm. I, have, I have low standards for perfect <laughs> the sun's out there's yard sale um, uh, <laughs> and that's all I really want and I'm happy with that and so sort of just you know this idea of of not knowing what the next not knowing that after the thunderstorm there's going to be a really glorious mm -hmm. um, perfect follow-up day mm -hmm. coming along um, but then it becomes a poem also about Kant and Caravaggio and Italian art and, and painting and the yeah, Tenebroso is the shadow, mm -hmm. right? So, so Caravaggio is in some way um, the master of deep shadows, of shadow. or one of the okay. early early uh, early painters who really understood how, how shadows could work. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, the sort of I guess the joy that we take in not knowing the full picture. So on mm -hmm. the one hand, it's very painful to know that your life isn't going to turn around and be great and no one wants to live through the horrible days of their lives. But there's also, I think, a joy that we would, would, would I sacrifice the bliss of waking up and going, ah, oh, sunshine, 65, uh -huh. thrift sale <laughs> um, for the, the surprise of that you know, in exchange, if it meant that I didn't have to live through like moments of uncertainty, and mm -hmm. we don't, we don't get to choose. Fortunately, I don't have to answer that question, <laughs> but I'm at least sort of saying like there is, there are good days too. Mm -hmm. In that poem, we have such moments then of, of high. Well, do, would you lend any credence to that idea of of high art versus? low art or the popular versus the um, the intellectual or, or elite? I, I, they don't, you know. yeah, they, they, people often say to me, how do you do it? And I just think, well, it just lives in, it's all, like, there. It's all in the eternal, it's in my eternal city. They don't, uh -huh. I don't um, taxonomize those and automatically say, and now I'm right. going to talk about fortune tellers or uh -huh. now I'm going to talk about a yard sale or um, now I'm going to talk about a really cheese ball B movie from 1957. Mm -hmm. It's just, I mean, that's literally, that's also just uh, an actual thing that happened. I was at a party at somebody's house and people started talking about, right. you know, you get a bunch of academics drunk and they start talking about opera and the pastoral. <laughs> and then finally somebody's, you know, son walks up and says, oh man, you know, that reminds me of the time I was watching this movie with my brother. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then that just is, this is an actual occurrence that happened. Uh, somebody started telling the story and then they sort of said, and then my brother said, you know, how's the tree get itself back up again? Mm -hmm. And I thought that was great. That was the, the smartest question a 10 year old's ever asked. <laughs> Would you call your work surreal? Um, we have the poem Un Chien Andalou, which is um, uh, references or response to a surrealist mm -hmm. uh, movie. Would you no. How would you say your work falls into, or does it at all, consider itself? I don't surreal. consider it surreal. Mm -hmm. I think of it very much as um, if there are things in the in the poem that you don't know. So, say for example, Emily Bronte's novel, right? Like, so I hit my, I threw a book at my friend. The book happened to be Emily Bronte's book. It happened to be Wuthering Heights. <laughs> um, it it doesn't. It's not necessary to the enjoyment of the poem that mm -hmm. you know that that is what the book is or not, but mm -hmm. that you don't know that that's what the book is. 
Um, it seems it's, to me that's all that's necessary for the enjoyment of, of these poems, which I do a great deal, is just a willingness to let them wash over yeah, you, to have the experience of them, um, which every time I pick this book up happens for me again and again. Um, so I really want to thank you for for being here today and for sharing these pieces. Well, thank you for having me. You're welcome. And I really look forward to your, to your reading thank later you. tonight. So this has been Brookdale's Visiting Writers Series. Uh, I'm Dr. Michael Brook with poet Kathleen Graber. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>